part one of this series, I presented the circuit of my RFID tag detector. Even before that, I explained the basic principles behind RFID in my video Hidden RFID Tags in Your Everyday Life. After talking so much about mere theory, it is time to lead you through the actual construction process of the detector. We will start with the RF section, which contains several inductive parts that need to be custom made. The first and most recognizable is the so-called detector coil. It is basically a solenoid of magnet wire which is supported by a bobbin. This bobbin is simply a section cut off a piece of plastic tubing. The diameter of this tube is about 58 mm, which seems to be a good size. After cutting off the section, two tiny holes with about 5 mm distance in between are drilled through the bobbin. These holes will be used to fasten the winding of the coil without the need for any glue. After drilling the holes and freeing the holes from swarf, one end of a piece of magnet wire is put through one of the holes so that it holds itself in place. The magnet wire is then tightly wound around the bobbin until five complete turns are finished. The wire I use is copper wire with a diameter of one millimeter which must be coated in insulating varnish. Bare copper wire won't do the job. Once the five turns are wound, the wire is held tightly in place and is trimmed so that about 10 cm of spare wire are left. The wire is then again put through a hole that is near the first hole but on the other side of the winding. The end of the wire is now put through this hole so that it again fastens itself. Once this is done, six more holes in pairs of two are drilled through the bobbin. The three pairs are to be equally distributed around its circumference so that the winding can be fastened from all sides. A piece of string is then threaded through one of the holes and then wound around the winding so that several loops of string are created around the magnet wire turns. The string is pulled slightly so that the turns of the magnet wire are pushed together. After about three to four loops are made, the piece of string is then knotted at least two times and finally, the ends of the string are cut off with a side cutter. After this has been done with all the six holes around the bobbin, the spare ends of the magnet wire are then trimmed and at the tips the insulation varnish is scraped off with a knife. After this has been done properly, their tips will be tinned with a soldering iron. With that being done, the detector coil is now completed. Its inductance should be around 1 microhenry. It is, however, very difficult to get accurate measurements for such small inductances. Now that the detector coil is finished, I will show you how the RF transformer which connects oscillator and RF amplifier stage is made. The windings of the transformer are supported by a special type of bobbin, which you can see here. This is basically a flange cylinder which contains a ferrite core that can be screwed in or out. This part is very hard to get. It can, however, be salvaged from old TV sets. Because you will probably only find it as a used part, it is necessary to get rid of its old winding first. After the old winding is completely removed, a piece of magnet wire is freed from the insulating varnish at one of its ends, which is then tightened around one of the pins at the base of the bobbin. Then a new primary winding is wound, 10 to 11 turns 
with 0.7 mm magnet wire or similar do a good job. To count the number of turns you can slip a pen over the turns and count the number of clicks you hear. It might work better than counting it visually. After that the other end of the magnet wire is again freed from the varnish and fastened around one of the free pins. Then the two ends of the magnet wire are soldered onto these pins. The primary winding is now finished. Now the secondary winding is still to be made. For that you take magnet wire with a diameter of around 1 mm and wind three turns around the primary winding. For this application the sense of winding is not important. The process is the same as with the primary winding. After finishing the secondary winding, the transformer is completed. Now a piece of vario board that will carry the parts of the R section is needed. Its necessary size will vary depending on the particular casing you're going to use. This one measures 10 cm by 6 cm. When working with a vario board, it is recommended to solder the biggest components on the board first and then arrange the smaller parts as you go. I started with the transformer and the power transistor, which takes a bigger portion of the vario board due to a heatsink that must be attached to it. Without it, the transistor will overheat. A small one like this though will be sufficient. Then the detector coil is attached to the board. For this it is soldered to a couple of pads to make the connection more durable. Next, I installed five 100 ohm quarter watt resistors in parallel to equal a 20 ohm resistor with a maximum power dissipation of over 1 watts, as I recommended for the resistor R11 in the circuit diagram. Step by step, all components of the R section are then soldered onto the board in the same fashion. Parts which are close together in the circuit diagram should also be close together on the actual board. This way additional wiring can be reduced. All components that are needed for the oscillators and IF amplifiers principal operation are now installed. The additional LC filters however are still missing. On this oscilloscope screen you can see that the circuit is indeed oscillating. The result however is everything but not a nice clean sinusoid. Our operating frequency of 13.56 MHz is superimposed by other frequencies that still need to be suppressed. Thus the LC filters should be installed. In addition to three 4.7 nanofarad ceramic capacitors, three chokes are needed. For that you should salvage three ordinary toroidal chokes from an old switch mode power supply like a cell phone charger or ATX power supply. This type of choke is also usually found in printers. You first have to remove the choke's old winding. Once this is done, wind 2 to 3 turns of 1 mm magnet wire around the ferrite core and scrape off the insulation at the ends of the magnet wire. And finally solder them to the pins at the bottom of the ferrite core. A new choke is now completed. After having installed all three LC filters according to the circuit diagram, I will now again measure the output of the amplifier stage. I do this by loosely winding two to three turns of insulated wire around the detector coil and attaching this wire to the oscilloscope. Now that the filters are installed, the magnet field generated by the detector coil is oscillating in a much cleaner sinusoidal fashion. To get the oscillator running, it will however be necessary to adjust the core inside the RF transformer. The magnet core of the RF transformer is adjusted so that the output voltage measured at the temporary measurement winding is maximal. If you do not own an oscilloscope, it is possible to attach a small light bulb instead of the oscilloscope to the measurement winding. The core of the RF transformer is then screwed in and out until the light bulb is becoming brightest. 
Notice that it is also possible to add an additional variable capacitor in parallel to the detector coil. This will make it possible to fine-tune the resonance circuit comprised of the detector coil in C11 to 13.56 MHz. With all that being done, the RF section is now ready to be used. So if you're interested in how the work on this detector goes on, watch the next video in this series. And please subscribe to my channel if you like my videos.